We're now going to continue with our discussion of problems with expected utility. We've already done problems one and two. We've already talked about those. Let's do problem number three. So problem number three, not only the utility of the outcome may matter, but whether the outcome resulted from a voluntary or from an involuntary choice. So the expected utility theory says that the only thing that matters is the payoff that you get and you plug it into your utility function to tell you how many quote-unquote utils that payoff gives you. The claim here is that your utility function actually changes depending on whether the risk was voluntary or non-voluntary. Uh, voluntary risk might be the risk of dying in an automobile accident if you decided to drive on the freeway as you were commuting to work or to school. Nobody forced you to drive on the freeway. You could have taken surface streets if you'd wanted to. And your risk of dying in a traffic accident is less if you take surface streets with lower speed limits than if you take a, a highway with with higher speed limits, but you voluntarily chose to take the highway. The idea is, th in situations of this voluntary choice, if you get a, a bad payoff, like a like a traffic accident, you you don't feel as bad as if you were forced to take a particular route. Um, let's say that you, you usually do take surface streets on your daily commute, but for some reason the surface street was closed. Maybe there was a prior accident or road construction or, you know, a flood or some kind of avalanche, whatever. You couldn't take surface streets. And so in an involuntary, because of it, well, because it, an inv I was going to say involuntary choice. It's not really, it kind of contradicts each other. Um, you didn't want to take the interstate highway, but you had to. It was involuntary. And if you then get into an accident, a, a traffic accident, on your way to work while you're on the highway, you may well feel worse about the consequences than if you had been driving on that highway through a voluntary choice. It's almost like you have two different utility functions, one for payoffs that occur when you undertook the risk voluntarily, and other for payoffs that occur when you undertook the risk involuntarily. So that is questioning, that is questioning this part of the expected utility function, which is, which is the utility function part of it. Okay, so that's problem number three. Problem number four is fairly simple, called the fallacy of optimism. The idea that bad things can't happen to me, they just happen to other people. So if you ask teenagers taking their first defensive driving class in school or just learning how to drive class, uh, how likely is it that they, they get into a traffic accident? Lots of them will say that they'll never get into a traffic accident. And that's the fallacy of optimism. So that's, that's an incorrect perception of the probability of something happening. Problem number five. By the way, some of these things are discussed in your textbook, but not all of them. Problem number five. Humans have a tendency to read patterns into randomness. In other words, to think that random things aren't random. As an example, suppose you're tossing a fair coin, and the pattern that you get is heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, tails. So in the middle, you have five heads in a row. Lots of people would look at that and say, oh, that, that wasn't random. Maybe that wasn't a fair coin, or something else happened. You're, you're, 
it's it's quite unlikely that that would just happen after randomness uh, because of randomness. Uh, but actually, if if you spend a while flipping a fair coin, you'll see that strings of heads or strings of tails occur more commonly than you would expect. Or to talk about population averages, most people, if you show them a list of the results of, let's say, 100 coin tosses, will be skeptical that the coin was actually fair. Because even if the coin was fair, because there'll be so many situations where you have a string of heads or a string of tails. In fact, uh, I was, um, I, I, I can't remember the source. Uh, I think I, I, I heard this on the radio, probably National Public Radio, a, a few years ago. That a, um, but it might not have been the radio, that a professor of statistics, I think at University of California at Berkeley, does an experiment where she, uh, near the beginning of the semester, is teaching introductory probability, she asks uh, one group of students in the class to flip a coin 100 times and write down the heads or tails. And then another group in the class to not flip any coin at all, but just uh, write down a sequence of heads or tails that, that they think would be likely to result if from, from coin flipping. And she leaves the room while these two groups work. And then she gets presented with their results. And she doesn't know which result came from which group. So she gets presented with a result from the group that actually flipped the 100 coins uh, and a sheet of paper with those heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, and so forth. And another sheet of paper from the group that didn't flip any coin but was just trying to simulate what a what the result of 100 coin flips will be. And she's been doing this for several years, and she's been able to guess which group was which every single time. And the reason is that the group that is actually flipping the coin will have strings like this sometimes. Not a lot, of course, but sometimes. Whereas the group that's not flipping the coin, but just trying to describe what they think a random coin is likely to generate, that group never writes down five heads in a row. Now, I don't know what the number is exactly, five. But the point is that that, um, that well, that people think that random things, tend to think that random things aren't random. And this is so regular that someone who actually understands probability, like a statistics professor at the University of California at Berkeley, can detect uh, when, when, un when undergraduate students in their first probability class are trying to come up, trying to depict a random sequence of 100 coin tosses because in their effort to imagine what a random sequence of 100 coin tosses is like, they're going to make mistakes. And the mistakes are going to be exactly along these lines, thinking that random things are not, are not random, so that they want, they'll avoid, avoid strings like lots of heads or lots of tails in a row. Um, there is some speculation that humans do this because um, there are evolutionary advantages to our ancestors to find patterns in nature. You know, if you're being stalked by a tiger, the tiger is well camouflaged. But if you look at the pattern of the tiger in the tall grass, and you think it's a random pattern, you're going to get eaten. And if you realize it's not a random pattern, it's a tiger in the grass, you'll run away and you won't get eaten. So perhaps in nature, there are not many things that are random. And so the human brain evolved 
not to make the opposite mistake. Not to say, oh, that's random, when it really isn't. But in any case, what it means is that nowadays, humans aren't very good at, at judging randomness. Um, problem number six. Oh, maybe I should say one more thing about problem number five. So when you see in sports journalism, the journalist saying that someone is on a hot streak, there's actually been some statistical research done on whether that really makes any sense. Um, maybe the person's not on a hot streak. A hot streak means they're being unusually successful. Well, maybe not. they're not being unusually successful. Maybe they're being actually just as successful as before, but you're just seeing a situation like this. You know, where instead of heads and tails, it's, let's say, making a basket in a basketball game. Uh, heads is you make the basket, tails is you don't make the basket. Um, you know, m maybe the quote-unquote hot streak is not because of any improvement in the skill of the player. It's just random luck. Similarly with things like uh, investments and stock prices. Someone, um, an investment manager, might have beaten the you know, stock market indexes year after year after year. Does that mean that the investment manager is a genius? No. If you've got, let's say, a thousand investment managers and none of them are geniuses at all, in fact, they're all just flipping coins, one or two of them are going to meet the market year after year after year after year. But that's just randomness. But of course, their marketing departments are going to try to make them out into geniuses. Uh, they're going to try to convince you that the, that the random things weren't random, but they were a result of skill on the part of the investment manager. Okay, problem number six, anchoring. Changing utility functions with time. So problem number five, randomness, was attacking this thing here that, that people don't judge the probabilities right. The, um, the next uh, problem number six, anchoring is getting at the is attacking the utility function part of the formula again. Suppose you're currently making fifty thousand dollars a year, and I ask, how valuable would dollars between fifty thousand and fifty-five thousand be? Well, certainly it'd be nice to get a raise of five thousand dollars. Contrast that with. Your current salary is fifty-five thousand dollars. So it's not instead of fifty, it's fifty-five. Now, what kind of value do you put on the dollars between fifty thousand and fifty-five thousand? So this is the difference between starting with fifty thousand dollars and contemplating getting five thousand dollars more, on the one hand, and starting with fifty-five thousand dollars and contemplating getting five thousand dollars less, on the other hand. Typically, people don't value the dollars between 50000 and 55000 the same way in these two situations. Typically, they value them less in this situation and more in this situation. This is a little bit like willingness to pay and willingness to accept. In fact, it's closely related. It's not exactly the same thing because... The willingness to pay and willingness to accept question is, let's say you start with $50,000 and you're either going to get $5,000 or you're not going to get $5,000 and have to compensate you. The other willingness to pay and willingness to accept question is you start with $55,000 and you're either going to lose $5,000 or you're not going to lose $5,000 and how much are you willing to pay to not lose $5,000. So this is, so both of those Let's say you start with 50,000 and then you either change or don't. Or you start with 55,000 and then you either change or don't. Here, you either start with 50 or you start with 55. So, you're, so, so it's two different starting points. So there's a subtle difference between this on the one hand and WATP and WTA on the other hand. But they're related. 
Now, the reason why people will often value the the dollars between the fifty thousand and fifty five thousand more if their salary is fifty five thousand than if it's fifty is because if their salary is fifty five thousand, they're kind of used to earning fifty five thousand dollars a year. They have planned expenditures taking into account the fifty five thousand dollars a year. And if they contemplate having to decrease expenditures down to fifty thousand dollars, then they start thinking about all the things they had planned on getting and used to be able to buy in past years that now they're not gonna have to not gonna be able to buy anymore. And that causes them lots of disutility. Whereas if you start with a salary of $50,000, then the extra $5,000 is nice, but I mean, you, you weren't counting on it. You haven't experienced that before. And so it's not as big a deal. So the anchor refers to the place where you are right now. In other words, the the first anchor is 50 and the second anchor is 55. So if your anchor if your anchor is 50, so you're currently earning 50, you have one utility function. And if your anchor is 55, you have a different utility function. Um, so that means that this utility function, which is supposed to be constant, the function itself, the shape of the function is supposed to be constant. The shape isn't fun isn't constant. It changes depending on what your current situation is. It changes where your anchor. It changes depending on where your anchor is. So that's going to mess up expected utility. That that's going to mean that people are going to behave and they're going to value things in a way that the expected utility theory is not going to capture. All right, I'm I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna stop here and we'll do the the other problems and the final objection in the next video.